and that, as far as the wrestling did, what I did was I intimidated a lot of people. I didn't give a Here we go. Welcome to Lila Studios. Real for you. I didn't even tell. So I didn't get my can, my food yet. You didn't tell me it was so going to start. And you got the same color shirt I do on. Well, we call each other. We always color coordinate. We do this every we week. What are you talking about? Coordinate. Listen, we got a guest on here. You got this guy booked. Your name alone got him on here. Are you going to introduce him or am I going I think to? I owe him some money. Uh, you owe him money. Is that why? Probably. Wow. Yeah. Call me. <laughs> so I. I <laughs> I got to introduce everybody here. We got Nova on here. Well, at least that's what I call you, Nova. Simon Dean, Mike Bucci, whatever you go by these days, probably Mike Bucci. I would, yeah, I would assume. I Mr. Fine. Bucci. Mr. Bucci to you. All the above. Me. Hey, thanks yeah. for coming on, man. Really appreciate it. No, nah, thanks for having me, guys. Like I was telling you before, uh, I'm doing this because you it's your two podcasts. Uh, I owe a lot to Rip. Von Lyles, you're always a good kid to be around. I always liked you. Uh, so when you guys asked, it's just I apologize. It took me this long to finally block out some time to do it. But uh, – I turned everything off for the next half hour, 45 minutes. Sweet. Oh, shoot. And then I'm back into, you know, the real world at eight o'clock with another Zoom call. So, oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> yeah. well, thanks, man. Really appreciate that. It means a lot. And I love when you call me a kid, too, and we're about the same age. That makes me even feel better. I just so. turned 50 in June. Hey, I'll, I'll be so. 49 in October. Oh, so. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. I You're still I a kid to me. I wish I was 49. That was the funny thing know. about, um, <laughs> like, being in OVW and stuff because I, I came in older. It, you know, as a first year guy, I was like 27 or whatever. Yeah. And everybody just thought and I had a baby face and everything. Everybody I thought you thought, were like 19. Yeah. I had everybody no idea. thought I was really huh. young. I was like 27. I was like older than everybody. Yeah. Huh. Until well, we you, didn't know. And no one cared. So until you, you came in. It. Yeah. You were killing it. So. <laughs> All right, man. So we're going to get started. So we just do a lot of like first on this show, um, really. And then we'll just kind of kind of go as we go. So. Um, I do know a little bit about you, obviously, because we were just talking. We we were in OVW a little bit um, together. I was a non-contract. You obviously were the, were the man when you got down there. But to back up a little bit before that, did you start training right during high school or after high school? After high school in right. Tom's River, New Jersey. Yeah, that's when I first started. Did you go to college first during that time? Not at I all. I was going at the same time. Did there you? was a – I graduated in 1990. There was a school – Rip knows him. There was a school that opened up in Bricktown, New Jersey. Founded by Iron Mike Sharp. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, Mike yeah. Sharp is my original trainer. The, the and, this uh, Mike Sharp? Yes. Uh, yeah. Canada's greatest athlete. Yeah. So a buddy of mine, Rich, was going to go to the Hart School, the Hart Dungeon, after he graduated high school. Well, uh, I was always a lifelong fan. We, Rich wound up going to Iron Mike Sharp School instead. So me and my brother, Donnie, we would go with Rich three nights a week to watch, uh, watch training. We met Mike Sharp. The original executioner, Tom Rumsey, was there. Uh, a young Devin Storm, Crowbar, was there. Big Jerry the Wall, uh, oh, wow. A Starling. A bunch of guys were all – that's where I first met Candido. So after about six months of going there and just kind of watching and hanging out, they just kept asking me, hey, Mike would always ask, hey, I know you want to try this. So I jumped in the ring, screwed around a little bit, took a few bumps. And I, I said to myself, look, I I'm, 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 have a full-time job. I was working at Wendy's. How about you? Hey, oh, yeah. uh, going to college for a degree in mathematics. And I said, this will just be something I do on the side. Like I had, he had school shows every two weeks. So to me, just to go to the school and bounce around and have fun with it and do a school show. This is like late 91, beginning of 92. I never had any visions ever of making a positive scent in wrestling. I never oh, thought wow. I would. The, the odds were completely stacked against me. So I just figured I'd do it for fun, like a bowling league, like a softball league. That's what this was going to be for me. Who wow, knows? That's pretty sweet. So see, math. I was a math teacher as well. And I also know um, Kiss fan too, right? You're a little bit of a Kiss fan, aren't you? Yeah, that's why. I mean, so that's that's one of the hooks we had in ECW. But yeah, uh, that's my uh, my favorite band. We got a lot in common, man. Yeah, see? And you, always, and you always worked hard, man. You were always a pleasure to be around. You always came up with a good attitude. You listened to everybody. None of us had the answers down there. We were all making it up as we went along, just yeah. with the guidance from Jimmy and Rip and Danny and all the guys. We tried yeah. the best we could and to try to pass it on to you guys. I always felt that the group that was there when I was there, Capitelli, Tomko, all of us, Hennigan, we always treated the non-contract guys for the most 99% of the time, the exact as us. Like there was no line in the sand. So yeah, I, I would, I would, agree. I would have to agree with that as far as, um, yeah, like in class and shows yep. and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't think anybody ever really took liberties on anybody that, that I could ever remember. We had one um, or two spot pickers, but that's a rip term spot picker. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, they, even that wasn't terrible, but it was for the most part, I always treated 
non-con. It didn't matter to me. If you were cool and you came in and wanted to work, that was we, we took you in, man. No, I always thought you were, you always kind of went above and beyond to help us, I say us, us out. And, you know, I, I just remember going to shows and sitting um, a couple different times. I can't remember why we were up in the crowd, up at the top. Maybe we were just afterwards. We came yeah. out, went up to watch matches or something. I remember Bam Bam, me, you, and you would just point out stuff to us. And, and we would kind of just watch the match and you would critique it a little bit and, and, um, <laughs> Pass on the knowledge, man. So that was uh, that was great. We'll get to more of that in just a second. I need to know though how you got from doing this bowling league, uh, uh, whatever league, yeah, wrestling I get it. league, from that to ECW. How do All you right, go? So from, how do you go from that and get in ECW? So Rip knows maybe not as much as you, Vaughn, but back in the day when you started, this was nineteen late ninety one, ninety two. So was, the territories were kind of fading. So one of the ways you got your foot in the door. When Arnold Skolin called to book the extras, when they were in the Northeast, they called Mike a lot, or they called Pretty yeah. Boy Larry Sharp, or some of the others. They brought up the job guys for enhancement. So I would go up there. Arnold, Arnold Skolin would book the, the job guys a lot, or book them through Mike. And so we'd go up there, and that's how I started. They would bring me up. I wrestled uh, Adam Bomb and Diesel oh, and Head Shrinkers. And, you know, Saturday morning was the battleground for pro wrestling, it wasn't Monday nights. Yeah. So Saturday morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, be, you know, up, up north in New Jersey, where I'm from, it was all about WB, WBF. Down yeah. here, more was, you know, mid south, all that kind of stuff. I followed it to a degree, but that was the land of WB up there. So I would go up and do the jobs. Uh, I probably went up about six, seven, almost a year straight. Uh, I was uh, starting to do independent shows as Supernova, doing the whole comic book superhero thing. Time out real uh, quick. What was yeah. that like going to WWE? Was it F probably at the time? Like, what was that like? Well, it was you? crazy. Like, I don't want to. I, I guess sometimes I glance over that part of it. But That's what I. Yeah, I think. Let, it'd be think wild. let that sink in for a minute. Like <laughs> today, know. it's totally different, too. This yeah. is when you're walking in a locker room and you're sitting around. You see Earthquake, Tugboat, Boss Man, this one, the large, larger life guys. I'm 19, 20 year old, this little like chubby, pale white kid scared to death with a year of wrestling training under my belt. And it's like, you know, here is Adam bomb versus Mike Bucci. Hey, how you doing? Hey, and we, you know, it's just, that, that's how you cut your teeth though. You used to get your 150 from Arnie at the end of the night, you got your 150 from him, but that's where I met like Pat Patterson and Tony Gurria and Sarge and all those guys were, believe it or not, like 15 years later, I'm into it. They remembered me It's crazy yeah. as that sounds, but that's how you start. That's where the Hardy started. Uh, uh, Scotty too hotty PJ just incredible we went up there you did jobs that's how you got your foot in the door yep, right it's a little bit different now it's a much different setting laid back but that was like man it was I can't believe it. like I look back in that sometimes like wow I really did that yeah but, I think it's wild so did, did Mike Sharp <laughs> did he smart you up a little bit before you went in not there, really or? Mike yeah. Mike's training was more you know Mike would spend I don't know if Rip knows all the stories from Portland. Oh, yeah, he does. But Mike was an eccentric guy, man. Uh, I owe a lot to Mike. He treated me great. He was awesome. But Mike didn't get in the ring every night. And every now and then when you saw him putting the oil on and warming up, he would warm up for like an hour. He was doing like P90X and a, a calisthenic exercises for like two hours before he'd come in the ring and do stuff. And then at the night, because our training was like 6 30, 7 o'clock at night. So I would work all day at Wendy's till like 3 o'clock. <laughs> leave, go to college for two or three hours, five days a week, get out of college and then go to Mike Sharp's three nights a week till 11 o'clock at night. So wow. we would leave training at 11. We'd come back like an hour or so later after eating at Denny's or something. He, Mike would be in the school by himself working out like with his gear on and stuff. It was crazy. Like the stories of Mike are legendary. Rip, you got but, a lot of laughs over there. You got to give us some Mike start, uh, Sharp stories. Rip so knows. Start. Yeah. Well, we did something. We was ribboning. We was ribboning one time like we left him. It was gonna, and we come back an hour later, and he was still in the shower singing. Yeah, <laughs> and he had he had so much soap on him and whatever. I said, you can't rib him. He's ribbing you, you marks. <laughs> he lived. Uh, he got locked in buildings several times, yeah. and everybody, the arena left, all the building, everybody left, and he was the last one in it, like stuff like that. But uh, Mike didn't t t sit down with the whole lot of the intricacies and first all that kind of stuff. I remember one of the times I was in the ring with Mike wrestling, and he bat me in the ropes. And uh, 
It was like an angle on one of his shows because I was the big heel on the show. I was a heavyweight champion, and Mike did an impromptu run in. I'll never forget. He backs me in the ropes, and he and he goes to break up, and he goes one two like that. And I just look at him and go uh, three, three four? four, and he goes boom, and he like <laughs> knocked the shit out of me. He's like, oh my god, I didn't know what he meant. But like the first time I ever heard the Office, the Iggy, all that kind of stuff was from Mike. But we did not sit down and do skulls, chessins, any of that like deep psychology stuff. Mike was a brawler, uh, a enhancement guy. Like it was not next level thinking. It was the bare basics. And yeah. then everything over my, you know, third, I've been affiliated with this now for 30 years. I just picked up from all the different minds along the way. But Mike gave me my start. That's awesome. So going to ECW then, how'd you, <laughs> how'd you get in there? And what was it like getting an ECW? You just said WWF back in the day. It's wild yeah. to think about. How so, about ECW? You just never looked. When I met you in OVW, I just didn't see you as like an ECW guy. Like you were a. No, because, well, back in the Northeast, like ECW and ECW was like, my God, down in this area, it was like weird, unrelated. You couldn't speak the word ECW down here. Matter of fact, when I first came down here, like Jimmy used to blow a gasket. Oh, you did oh, all yeah. that ECW crap. Blah, blah. But ECW was starting to get an underground movement. This is 95, 96. Obviously, I was following it. Stevie Richards was wrestling there. Some of my other friends are wrestling there. So I used to go and just watch the shows. Well, this is where it's like perfect place at the right time. I was on an independent show in New Jersey, New Jack City Wrestling. I'm wrestling in the main event, and I'm full-blown superhero gear. I had the cape on, the kids coming to the ring with me, this whole schnabitz. And uh, the Raven was on the show also. Raven was just getting his jump, his big push in ECW, and uh, – one of the girls who was telling t-shirts pulled me aside and said, Hey, at the end of the night, she said, Hey, Scotty wants to talk to you. And I'm like, Oh my God, like what, what did I do wrong? <laughs> so he pulls me aside. Hey kid, you know, this gimmick is great, man. You know, what are you like an Adam West Batman? And I go, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm going for. And he said, well, I'm starting this group in ECW. I'm going to have a bunch of flunkies with me. I got your buddy, Stevie. Uh, I got this other guy, this big fat guy, man, with blue hair. We're going to call him the blue meanie, man. And I knew what that was from yellow submarine kind of. So he goes, you'd be the great, a, a perfect compliment to this group. Now, I didn't know this at the time because I wasn't smart. What Scotty was doing was recruiting guys to add to his act that were going to be dirt cheap. Because I think when I first started going, I was getting like 25 bucks a night. All but right. we were there to run interference and be used for spots in the match to help get his act over. Yep. which was brilliant on his part, but he gave us the rub. So he said, hey, I want you to put together a tape of just your ring entrances. You run into the ring with the kids, with the cape and all that, just that. And I want to show it to Paulie and, and, and Taz and Tommy. Now, I had met Tommy Dreamer once or twice on some independent shows, but we weren't friends. I mean, I just knew him right. from the worldwide wrestling shows. So I said, okay, I'll put this tape together. So I put this tape together. I, I get a hold of him. He goes, hey, I'm DJing at a club called Moon Dancers up in Philadelphia. Why don't you come by on Wednesday night and drop the tape off? Well, you can imagine what kind of club it was. Yeah. So imagine me, 23, I think at the time, scared out of my mind, because this is Raven, walking into this strip club to give him my <laughs> videotape of me dressed up as a superhero running around. That's awesome. So I give him the tape. Like two days later, I get home from work. My mom's like, hey, there's a guy named Raven on our answer machine for you. And I'm like, what? This is when we still had answer machines. So I play it and he's like, hey, kid, you know, I, uh, I showed your tape to uh, Paul and Tommy, man. They think it's great. You know, it's fantastic. You really you got to come down to the arena and meet everybody. And I'm like, holy shit, like this is this is it because ECW is starting to explode. I just wanted my foot in the door. Yeah. Like I was still by no means a like, good worker. I wasn't polished or any of that, but I had a good gimmick. I had a little following in the Northeast and I knew if I can get in there, I could, I could work hard and prove my worth. So, well, man, to this day. Besides, like, the birth of my daughter and getting married and divorced now, but today I got married, like, the most nervous points in my life I could ever think of, that was probably the most nervous day of my life was going to the arena the first time, walking back towards that curtain. This is even more nervous than going to WB job work. Yeah. But, and then telling the security guards, hey, can you tell Scotty that Nova's here to see him? And the yes. guy popped his head out and said, hey, come on back. And I was like, holy shit. And I went back and the first person I met was Beulah. And I saw Tommy and I met everybody. Dreamer came over, handed me a hot dog and said, hey, job doesn't really pay anything. Show up when you can. Scotty wants you to be part of his group. Welcome to ECW. And that was it. And then I just started going to shows. I just started going as much as I could, working out in the ring before the show. 
you know, the flock was taking off and then, you know, Raven Lem, different incantation. The BWO was obviously legendary, uh, all the other stuff we did, but it all started because I was in the right place at the right time. And I took advantage of the opportunity. I could have told them, no, nah, I'm good. Or I yeah. could have thought I was over, but I knew I wasn't. So I was going to do whatever I had to. So did that, did that like, did it scare you at all? Like did ECW, like I just saw some, like the old stuff on TV, what I got like three in the morning where every clip was people going through nine tables. And it was basically an infomercial at that time. Like did, that, did. did you think, man, what am I getting myself into no, at all? Because or here's you just why, like, man, because I knew a lot of the guys were already there. Yeah. But to me, and I've always said this to me, ECW was always about the work ethic of the guys, the environment of the company, the us against the world type attitude. It was never about the blood, and the barbed wire, and the tables. Everybody that did that did it to their own accord. They did it. Okay. For, sometimes it made sense. Sometimes it didn't. Not everybody did it. OK, I mean, half the three quarters of the matches on the show did not have that stuff in it. So I would always say, like, you know, ECW was about the grit, the determination, the hard work, the work ethic, busting your ass in the ring every night. The first match went out there and tried to wrestle like a main event. And then the second match, the third match, everybody went out there and said, hey, follow that. And we did. And everybody watched the show. They watched every ounce of the show. I mean, you had Van Dam and the Sandman high five and Danny Doring and Roadkill when they came to the back. That shit never happened the whole entire run of WWE. Right. I, I don't I can't tell you. You might saw somebody in Gorilla and get a thumbs up or something, but that was it. Yeah. Very rarely did you ever go in the back and have the entire locker room watching your stuff. So that's pretty wild. Hey, yeah. did you know did you know Rip was with uh he was with Raven in uh what was that global? Yeah. Yeah. Global, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, I was always a fan of the hustler. Yeah. That's why when I first came down here, I was like, man, I can't believe that uh I'm gonna have Rip. And I knew Jimmy through the world of like Dennis Carluzzo, my brother and Donnie B, and that whole like Jimmy pushed for me to come down. Jimmy, uh, you know, so so ECW runs its course after five years there, you know, uh, and they go out of business. And uh my last two or three years at ECW. I think I got to the point where I was one of the most over guys in the show. I mean, that's just this reality. You can go back and watch the footage because the fans saw me go from like this like comic book superhero guy to a dude who was jacked and shredded and busted his ass every night in the ring. And I got over the generic way. Like the fans dictated who was going to get over. I didn't dictate it. They did. Right. So they came on the journey with me. Uh, ECW ended. Uh, started traveling around the world. I went to Germany, Japan, Mexico, wherever I could because I knew I was going to get a shot at WWE eventually. Yeah, and uh, I was in UPW in California. We we can go off into that in a minute, but uh, the UPW shows out there is when Jim. I didn't Ross know you went out there at all. I didn't. Yeah, know I was. I spent a year out in UPW. Okay. When, when I was traveling everywhere, Rick. We'll go into that story in a minute. But uh, Rick Bassman, he helped save me. Rick Rick Bassman actually helped me enough where I probably would have quit wrestling if I didn't run into him at that point. But because uh, I was disenfranchised. But when Jim Ross saw me out there, the the main event that I was me and Frankie Kazarian, we were a team called Evolution. We wrestled uh, Edge and Christian. Oh, wow. And Jim, Jim Ross pulled me aside afterward. He said, look, we're going to get to you, Mike. We just bought WCW. We have all these guys in Heartland. We're going to get to you. And I was like, all right, no problem, Jim. So I went around another couple months just traveling. And then I was doing a motion capture for a video game in California. And uh, Kevin Kelly reached out to me and said, hey, we want to do business with you, man. Are you interested? I said, yeah, what do you got? So he told me and. Like, I'm going to say no. And yeah. then Johnny called me because Johnny wanted me to come do some shows in WCW when ECW ended. And I okay. said, well, I don't know what's going on with Paul yet. I don't know if he's going to go to WB. I don't even know if I'm still in the contract at ECW. I had no idea. None, none of us knew. But uh, and then I said, OK, we'll do it. And the next thing I know, uh, Johnny has called me. He said, hey, you're going to OBW. I found out years later that Jimmy and Danny, like the year before that WrestleMania, I think it was Toronto. They had a big meeting and they had a list of talent they wanted to do business with. That my name was on it. And Jimmy was basically like, look, you're going to give me, you know, Luther Reigns and this one and that, all these giants. I want Nova too. I don't care who else you send me. Just send me Nova. Because oh, wow. he saw me as like his Ricky Morton. I know he did. He saw me as like his Ricky Morton guy. He had all these monsters there. He had Cena who had been beaten a year. And here I was 195 pounds in the morning when I woke up with long hair, leather pants, a, a smaller baby face who could sell underneath and pull out a win. Yep. And that's exactly what we did. So when you were getting all those those phone calls to get signed, I mean, you've been around probably about what a decade at that time. Ten years at that point. Yeah. Was it still like I'm nervous, excited? I finally made it, or were you just ready by that time? Or nope, was I wasn't it? nervous at all because when Johnny Ace finally said, "Hey, man, 
We're gonna, I said, it's about time, Johnny. I should have been here years ago. I thought, honestly, when ECW ended, within a month, I would be in WWE because my work was on point. I looked great. My gear was good. Like, there was no reason. I was doing dark bunch of, I did several dark matches with WWE. And yeah. I had like the Hardys, a bunch of other people coming over and saying, oh, you're going to you're going to be with us. No problem soon. Like, this is crazy. They even had there was no superhero on the roster at that time. Shane wasn't there yet. I was a superhero, too. So, yeah. like, they could have done anything, but they didn't. But it gave me a chance to go to zero one to do a show for FMW, to go to England, to go to the places I wanted to go. And then uh, eventually I was sitting in Rapungi, Japan, when I called Jimmy from down to, from Rapungi. And say, hey, Jimmy, I'm finishing up this tour of Japan, and this is what I'm going to be doing. And he laid, Jimmy laid out like six months of angles. That's awesome. The first night, he's like, he told me, he's like, you're going to beat Cena the first night, then you're going to do this, you're going to do that. It all came true. The six flags, working with Lawler, all of it. I never looked back. That's wild. That, I mean, that's what he, that's his biggest, well, you don't want to talk current wrestling, but that's his biggest thing with the, uh, the current product. They don't plan anything out. They have no... When you so when you got there was Rip the he was he the trainer yeah. when he first Rip got down was there? a trainer there he I think I I don't even know if you were doing a whole lot of you would do a show every now and then right just to pop a town or something they brought you out for an angle like I think you wrestled like Jason Lee one time or something or you ran and hit him with the kendo stick oh, but I probably hit him in the kendo <laughs> stick when he did something in the ring wrong yeah but Rip was <laughs> I mean I, I I prided myself on getting there first every single day if not second. Rip was always there with the whistle on his neck. And I mean, the entire year and a half to two years I was down there, there's no way that I missed five training sessions. And I would say half of them were because I had to go to Canada to drive up there to help my wife, who was going to be my wife, bring her over to the country. So I was gone for like two extra days, but I never missed a practice. I never missed TV. Uh, So did you know, did you know about Rip? Like when you got down there or was that your first encounter? No, I knew this. I knew rip rogers i didn't know the hustler rip because i was i didn't know him personally i didn't was around him here's the thing i can never what you see on tv magazines print whatever that is until i'm around you shake hands you have a conversation like it's just a perception of what i saw so once i got around him and i was like holy shit this is like an evil genius man i knew back then he was a throwback i mean rip was not an ecw fan but rip would have been a legitimate legend in ECW, if he came walking through that curtain, because those crowds were so smart and so hardcore, they absolutely would have known who he is. If he came out with the ponytail, the Adrian Street, like doing all of his rip stuff, they would have went nuts because he was so respected as a worker. So when I got down there, I didn't know Danny as much. I only knew Danny's legend from the nightmares. Because and then uh, I knew Jimmy. But yeah. going down there, looking around, I was like, man, if I want to be a you know major league, bas- if I want to be an NBA player. I can't be out here playing against the Globetrotters. Like, I need to be around the best. So that's what OVW that's was. Rip, you uh, have any first impressions, any any memories of Nova down there in uh, OVW? Well, it takes a while because it's like with any with any girl, they can fool you for a long time. And then they'll eventually, eventually the real thing comes out. So guys can uh, act one way, blah, 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 and then – give them enough rope and, uh, and some of them will be even better than you thought they were. And some of them will hang themselves, but I just want to see what's going to happen. Uh, mostly I just observe. I might say something one way to critique them or whatever, just to get a, just to get a bone check. Let's just see, just to see, can they take constrict, constructive criticism, even if I've totally bullshit them and make something up just to see how they react to it. Some people will just laugh and say, yeah, okay. <laughs> Surely not you. Surely you wouldn't do something. I listened to everything you ever told me. I mean, some of it would work for me or some of it wouldn't. And if I, if it didn't work for me, it's because I tried it and I just couldn't figure it out or it didn't. I would just scratch my head and be like, I don't know about that one. But everything else, like I never ever heard the words kick it into gear or shift the gear heat or like transitions or like I never did any of that in ECW. It was like I worked hard. But I tell people all the time, like, Nova worked hard, but Simon Dean worked smart. There's no way in the world I would have been Simon Dean if I didn't go through OBW and learn the teachings of Rip, Danny, Jimmy, and then take the teachings of Dean Malenko and Arn Anderson and Fit and create it for what I could do. So that's – there's no chance There's no chance I have a WWE career if I didn't go to OBW and put the time in to learn the craft down there. There's just awesome. no way. It's awesome, Rip. Well, that's just, I say every guy I get on here, everybody's got a different story, comes from different beginnings. Everybody's got a different perception. And like me, well, it's like, well, there's, 
there's Sylvester Stallone. Well, is he acting like Rocky? No. Well, is he Rambo? No. What is he? Well, he's just over there eating hot dogs, you know. <laughs> but you get caught into what you see on TV, like that's really somebody, you know. Yeah. I yeah, never... I can I can definitely tell a difference between like you coming in here and we, like we've had Jeter and Mondo and much of the guys who were a lot younger when they went to OVW and I think a lot of them had a different perception when they got signed at like twenty or twenty one and I hear all the time I just got signed too early I was just too young I just didn't understand like looking back at it now I get it but it sounds like you've got a totally different perspective on I totally all did I looked at OVW for me this is for me. I looked at OVW as the final stop of where I needed to go, like a foster home before I went to the big, I was never going to go to WB and then go do something else after that. I had a 10 year journey and I only had like a 15 year plan. Like I was never going to be a guy who was working in WB when I was 45. It just, it was never part of my idea. I had business ventures outside of there, other stuff I wanted to do. And I was going to try to ride this train for as long as I could until the wheels fell off. So when I went to OVW, there was no chance that I was going to waste a single day. Because when people would tell me after they got released, the worst thing that people used to tell me was, man, I never got a chance. You did get a chance. You got a chance every single day you went into the school. You got a chance even if it put you on TV for 30 seconds. You got a chance when the writers came down to get in front of them. You got a chance to send promos in. And I did whatever it was. I never wasted a single day. I mean, I took a Simon Dean was 100 percent my creation from start to finish. WB had absolutely nothing to do with it. I didn't even tell anybody I was doing it in OVW until the first day I did it when the writers and Vince came down because I was getting myself out of there. So that's wild. I yep. just I just remember you in in, in practice, the, the times I was in class with you and you were talking about kicking it up a notch and that kind of stuff. I remember we'd do something with like holds and he would say like 10 arm holds or something and you yeah. can't repeat or whatever. And I could do like two of them. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Then you would come over and just show me boom, 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 like 10 different ways. I was like, God, oh, that is just awesome, man. Well, like, I prided myself in that. Thank you for that, Vaughn, because I just figured I wasn't going to be – I wasn't O'Hare or Jindrak. So I yeah. wasn't going to be the tallest, the biggest, strongest, about all that other stuff. But I also said, well, I'm not Rey Mysterio, and I'm not the big show, so I'm not going to be the biggest or the smallest. I'm somewhere in the middle. What can I do to be different? And in ECW, I was always like the innovator guy. I was different. So here I just figured I needed to learn as many ins and outs as I could because if I was a heel, which they were, I knew they were going to bring me up as – I couldn't rely on somebody else to help me out to get myself in a situation. So I had to be good enough to turn things around in the ring to be a situation to favor me without my opponent even knowing what I was doing. Like I actually had to do his stuff for them sometimes, yeah. which actually worked out best considering I got stuck with a bunch of guys up there, usually brand new on SmackDown. They came in, they were green. They always got stuck with me for the first couple months. And I liked it because I was helping them out. They didn't even know what I was doing. So I, I, that's all came through the training at OBW. Awesome. We got We got about 10 minutes yeah. here. Uh, you, you mentioned Simon Dean. <clears throat> so you created the character you said, which I didn't know that. How, yep. how did that come about? I don't think I've ever even heard the story. How Simon I was Dean going back and forth about. for a while doing dart matches. Uh, they would bring me on the road for a couple of days. And then this is after about a year and a half in OBW. And then finally I'm on the road one day and Johnny says to me, Hey, tomorrow and johnny was a big fan of mine johnny ace helped me out a lot and he said tomorrow at tv vince wants to meet with you he just wants to talk to you and figure out how we can get you out of system i was like okay so the next day i meet with vince again not scared at all because i knew what i was doing i sat down with him and he said you're technically as sound as anyone we have on the roster what is your idea to make us money and because i and he said it wasn't offensive he goes i just I don't see you make it because they were calling me Mike Bucci on some of the shows, not even Nova sometimes like, well, this is stupid. <laughs> and uh, so I said, look, boss, I said, I have an idea. I said, I want to be a cross between like Tony Little and Jack Lane. You got a lot of crummy looking wrestling fans out there. We can really tear these people apart. I could be like a smarmy snake oil salesman type. Cause like in real life, I talk fast. It's the New Jersey thing. I'm animated. I'm very like, kind of like full of shit sometimes, so to speak, it could come off like that way. So it's very insincere, like the facials and all. I knew I had all that and I knew I could make it work. So I told him this and he's like, huh? And I said, yeah, you know, I know you got a bunch of Ico pro laying around, which perked him up. Cause I also know Vince is a body guy, workout yeah. guy. I, they never had anybody like this. So he said, okay, well, that sounds pretty good. You know, what's your idea? I said, you know, I want to film. And he goes, we can film some vignettes. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to do vignettes. I want to do infomercials. And he's like, oh my God, it's never been done. <laughs> so we tossed around some ideas and he said, look, 
see what you can come up with for this. I'm going to be down in OBW in about a week or so. Let's see what you come up with. So I went back down. I didn't, I told Danny, I'm pretty sure I told Danny. I didn't tell anybody else. I had a whole different outfit to hold in there. And all the writers came down. The only, it's, this van only ever came down to OBW one time ever. Wow. All the other time they send all the agents and everybody else, but Vince came down one time. So that day we had a bunch of tag team matches. I wrestled like four times that day. I wrestled a tag team match with Capitelli with this one. I mean, you name it. I did them all at the end of the day. Johnny A said, Hey, before we wrap this up, go get your stuff on, come out and do one more match. So I only person I smartened up was Aaron Aguilera because I needed an opponent. So they're about to wrap it up. They played Let's Get Physical or something by Newt, Newt John. I came out. I go in the ring. I had the whistle. I'm doing this whole thing. They're like, what the hell? Aaron Aguilera came in. I wrestled him. And I'm doing the kicks in the corner. I'm looking at my pulse and doing the whole gimmick. That's I come out afterwards. I cut a promo. And I'm like, you know, my name was going to be Sonny Slade. I wanted to call myself Sonny Slade. And I was going to have Sonny Slade's super system of self-help and supplements. And I go, you have to achieve to believe. And I'm pointing at Vince and I'm cutting a promo. I threw a protein bar with him. At this point, I'm like, I'm either getting out of here. I'm getting fired. Yeah, yeah. right. Especially if you I throw swear a to God, man. at the end of the thing, Johnny came over to me and goes, you need to groom another locker room leader here at OBW because you're starting on the road next week. Yeah, that's and awesome. then the next day, they, the, I, got a, I got flight information to go to Connecticut where they started to direct my infomercials. And they called me. I'm in the hotel the day before we're filming it. And Big called me and he goes, hey, what do you need for this? And I'm like, wait, what? So I said, I need a weight bench. I need fried chicken, a girl, like all this stuff I laid out. It was all there the next day. Yeah. <laughs> so the next day, within like 48 hours of being OVW, I'm in, the, I'm in this headquarters directing my own infomercials for television. Oh, God. And that's how it went. So there's never a bad idea, man. What they don't want you to say is, I can do whatever you need me to do because they already got enough. Rip would say, be overprepared. And I was overprepared at that point to do whatever they could. But you bet your ass that they were going to give me a chance to come up with an idea. I was going to control my own fate. I mean, yeah, you said people say, well, I never got a chance or never got a shot. They probably were asked the same question and had nothing. I'll do whatever you want, Mr. McMahon. Thank you very much. Just be different, man. The one of the most over gimmicks they ever had in the history of the company, if there was a the boogeyman. Now, Marty couldn't string five moves together, but it didn't matter. And yeah. nobody else could have pulled that off except for Marty. That's God, why that... they had guys like me there to wrestle guys like Yeah, Marty. you I did was that guy... stuff with him. That was yes. great, man. I, I think you brought me out to the ring as a security guard. Didn't you drag me out there? It was like Cliff Compton. A bunch oh, of no, guys. no. I, I wasn't in them. on that. No. no. <laughs> but I, there's two kinds of guys in the business, and Rip knows this. Guys that you build the company around. Bobby Lashley, Boogeyman, a bunch of these or guys that help build the company. I was a carpenter. I was somebody that could help build. And I took a lot of pride in that. So. Yeah. I, 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 dude, I'm not just putting you over because you're on here. I'd love the Simon Dean thing. I thought it was awesome. You had Thanks, some great man. stuff with Boogie yeah, Man and Batista. And just that. Stone Cold, then, Stone Cold was fantastic. That one was my favorite one ever. Yep. And then you start bringing the Segway thing out or whatever it was. I was at a, I was at the casino one night. I was at the casino with my wife and I saw some security guards on the Segways. And I said, look at this. They're too lazy to walk around. And I looked at her. I said, oh, my God. So the next day and the next week I go to TV and I showed Stephanie a picture of it. And she goes, I don't know what that is. I've seen that on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Let me ask Vince and see what he thinks. Then Vince said, I don't know what it is. Just get it if you want it. So I went and got the Segway. I bought it. Brought it to the shows and people still remembered. It was different. That's what was the gym bag, bringing the gym bag to the ring. Yep. The first time I did it, I was going to the ring. I had my wedding ring. I took my wedding ring off, put it in the bag. I didn't want to leave it in the back. So I just brought the gym bag to the ring with me. I left it in the corner the whole time. And at the end, I'm on a cell in a dark match. Shelton Benjamin's coming to get me. I started crawling for the bag just to grab it. Like I was getting something out of it. The night's over. I'm leaving. Vince stops me in the hallway. and goes, hey, by the way, who told you to bring a gym bag to the ring tonight? I go, nobody. I go, did I have to ask permission for that? He goes, no, I love it. I wish more people would do things like that. Uh, that's What's going to happen, man? Take a chance. But then yeah. that's again, though, like you, you were, said how polished you were and all that kind of stuff. Now, you do have to be polished, you know, to basically carry the boogeyman, obviously. Yes. But you still weren't doing that kind of wrestling when you got up there. No. When you were, I mean, you were like a Nick Dinsmore almost. Yes, like I had to be. That's how I learned how to work smarter. And yeah. I, look, I tell people all the time, Nova made some money in ECW. I mean, I hate to say Simon D became rich because I learned how to work. They had me on everything. 
And it was like learning what the gimmick was. How am I working for the match? How am I working for my opponent? What's my purpose to the company? I made myself invaluable in the sense that they needed me because every single week they were going to put me on TV against somebody. And it didn't matter if I lost because I always got my heat back on the microphone. Could you imagine if I had been around in today's day and age with social media and Twitter and Instagram, all that stuff? I would have had 24-hour people in the gym. I would have had workout program. I would oh, have had God. everything. Yeah. But it's just a different game today, man. Yeah, your TikTok would have been on fire, man. I would have been every it would have been incredible. But I also think a lot of the stuff that goes on today would have driven me nuts and it wouldn't oh. have lasted. So and that's fine. For I'm sure. a throwback. I'm a throwback to an old era. And I, I'm more than content with that. Cool. We got we got about two and a half minutes. I, you, you brought up me being maybe a, a security or dragging you out. I did not do that, but I do owe you a, um, a thank you. I think it was when you were a talent relations. I remember our, our uh, head. Of, what, what, uh, what's the word? What were you after? Talent development stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember that WrestleMania Rip had called me and said he had talked to you or something. You got a bunch As a of guys druid? Were you a druid? I was a druid at WrestleMania yeah. 23, man. That was I tried to take care of all the boys as much as I could, man. You know, I, 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 thanks for that. Von Lyle. In that role, whenever – every in my career before that, I always try to take care of the guys as much as I could. There's so many guys I helped over the years, man. I'm not going to sit here and name names and list lists, but trust me, dude, it's in the hundreds. And uh, I tried the best I could. You know, my, my wrestling career is long behind me. I did the best I could with it. I tried to be a good guy as much as I could. Uh, every now and then you had to, you know, pull a punch here and there. But 99% of the time I was good to everybody who was good to me. No, I thought, yeah, I, yep. I, I never saw anything different out of you from the time I was around. I just remember I was still, I was still a school teacher and I, and I had a voicemail. We had a faculty meeting and Rip had left me a voicemail on my cell phone. So I got, I snuck it out and, and he said, Hey, I talked to Nova. He said, can you get a tuxedo? I need you to get a tuxedo. You're going to WrestleMania, blah, blah, blah. And I was just sitting there. I'm in a faculty meeting of teachers getting a call. Now That's I'm not cool. wrestling, but still yeah. that I'm going to freaking WrestleMania, you know, and I'm like, Ah, oh, this is this is awesome. Hell yeah, man. That's how we did it, bro. We always took care of the guys back then. It's just a different ball game today. I think I was in it during the best period ever from like that late 90s, early 2000s. There'll never be another time like it. I had a lot of fun in it, and I owe I owe a lot to Rip. Without him, I wouldn't be where I am. Awesome, man. I, I didn't know. I um, I mean, I knew you guys probably didn't have any like heat or whatever. I just I never knew. I never know half the guys, nope. you know, they get on here. I don't know. How if Rip like called it. me tomorrow and needed a thousand bucks and a place to stay because he was on the run for the cops, he I got I got it for him. Oh, don't tell nope. him that. Yep. <laughs> nope. Rip <laughs> always did right by me. <laughs> he'll be he'll be calling you for sure. Don't tell him that. <laughs> hey, it, it went under a minute. I don't know where we're at. This thing usually just runs out. This time just flew by, but I really appreciate you coming we'll on. We'll do it man. again, fellas. This is great. Yeah, really appreciate you coming on. Um we you got a whole episode of him talking about when he was director of talent relations or whatever. Oh, he that went, took years off my life. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, cool, but he went but, from this to that. Just yeah. boom. You know, I loved helping the guys as much as I could. That's why I did it. It, it sucked. Every other ounce of it, it was awful. Yeah. But being able to help people live a dream, that was cool. Yeah. Big gold and a billfold. So swole that I can't get the shit closed. So I money fold and rubber band wrap. And when it pop, bitches sound like a hand clap.